I am Bodhi Lama Zangshou. I am a teacher in the yes, Dzogchen, Longchen, Mintig lineage of Tibetan Buddhism. And since there's, there's, a, there's a few of those, we, we actually call ourselves the Dzogchen Buddha Path. And it's under the guidance of my uh, precious root guru, his eminent Dzogchen Kempo Choka Rinpoche. And I've lived with Rinpoche for just about 10 years now at our main retreat center. And we have, um, well, we really have one project, and that is establishing the, the Dharma system in the West. When, when Buddha taught uh, 2,900 some years ago, uh, it, it wasn't just a matter of uh, some teachings and you know, maybe you should do this and do this meditation. There's a whole system to how people practice, how people integrate with each other, how people act with each other, and there's a schedule. and all of those things, and that tradition was uh, perfectly preserved in a uh, monastic sense, um, you know, all the way until uh, just, you know, last century in Tibet. And um, their schedule is, uh, you know, quite rigorous, and there, there's no room for anybody to have a day job. Uh, so, you know, you, uh, you know, you start at age five or ten or something, and then, uh, you know, you, you spend, you know, 13 years studying the basics and you know, scholasticism and then begin meditation programs. And, and basically, the result, which is enlightenment, waking up from suffering, having uh, sustainable real happiness and true happiness, uh, that result has been continually achieved in every generation in our tradition. But um, you know, now the world is different than it was. And there's no way for this kind of tradition to survive uh, in the modern world. And so we're, we're trying to create something that modern people can practice. And uh, that requires a certain amount of effort. And you know, we're sort of building things from the ground up. And um, in, uh, when Buddhism came from India into Tibet, they had imperial support. There was this emperor called uh, Trisong Detsen. And he, he put the entire, all of the resources of the empire, the Tibetan empire, he put into establishing Dharma. And uh, so they essentially emptied the Tibetan treasury into India and brought back all of the scholars and all of the enlightened masters and all of the texts and all of the holy objects and everything that they could get their hands on. And it took them about a hundred years or so to really establish they would translate and retranslate and re-retranslate, and then they would practice, and someone would get results. Someone would become enlightened. They would wake up. And then they'd say, well, we should look at that part of the translation. <laughs> then they'd re-re-retranslate. And um, in, in the West right now, we don't have that kind of uh, sponsor, and we don't have as much of a systematic approach where an entire kingdom, basically, is being uh, tasked with this project. There's just uh, a few dedicated people, of which I am one. So we, um, <clears throat> we maintain a rigorous schedule. You know, when, I'm, when I'm at the retreat center, we work. Uh, it's, uh, since, since technically we are doing practice while we eat, you can say it's about a 16-hour day. And then um, we don't have weekends. We, we work seven days a week. So you, you can sort of lose track of the days because you do the same thing basically every day. And um, <clears throat> so there are uh, techniques that we employ as Buddhists to be able to keep up with this schedule. And, um, and it gets to a point where some of them, I know they, they really work for me and they work for us. And some of them... Um, won't be applicable to you as much because you have different goals. Um, our goal is to establish the Dharma system. And we've got reasons behind that. And you know, we can say this reason and this reason, and I could I could unload a bunch of Sanskrit jargon for these different intentions and so forth. But um, basically what it comes down to is we don't want suffering for ourselves or for anybody. 
And also, we want happiness for ourselves and for everybody. And those of us who have practiced and have become steeped in this tradition and see it, wow, this is a great way to get happiness. This is a great way to avoid suffering. The more I practice this, the less I suffer. The more I practice this, the happier I get. And it's not just like a you know, nice, cutesy, oh, I feel so good, happiness. But actually, we become uh, more functional people, better people. And so what Buddha taught is that if you want to become happier and suffer less and uh, you know, more functional, then you need to identify the causes of suffering and eliminate them. And you need to decrease and eliminate them. You need to identify the actual causes of happiness. You need to uh, accumulate those and perfect them. Now, for us, um, those of us who live at the center, what we are doing is what all of us absolutely want to do in life. And you know, we've, uh, we've, there's, there's a great opportunity cost for being there. You know, basically, you know, we, uh, those of us who have lived there, you know, we give up uh, you know, working a job and uh, you know, having uh, you know, too much of a social life outside the center because there isn't a lot of time for that. Um, and, but uh, in doing so, we have uh, sort of let go of more peripheral things. And we're engaged in what we wholeheartedly, sincerely, 100% want to do. And Rinpoche uh, is so great. He was saying, you know, when, when people go on vacation, you know, they, they work hard every day, right? You get up, you go to work, you've got a bunch of things you want to get done in the day, and you, you push it, you push the envelope, you get as much done as you can. Then you go back and, you know, you, you uh, do some laundry, uh, eat dinner, grab a beer, and go to sleep. Well, when people go on vacation, their schedule actually doesn't get uh, less rigorous, usually. They fly to Hawaii, so they've got to deal with this long plane trip. And then they get up because they want to get all these things done. And they're driving here, and they're driving there, and they're renting a car, and then this doesn't work. And actually, people work just as hard on vacation as they do uh, in their jobs often. So what's the difference? What is enjoyable about that? Why is that relaxing and going to work not relaxing? And uh, the answer is they want to do it. They want this. This is their idea of fun. So Rinpoche is saying, well, this is, this is what you want to do, right? This is your idea of fun. Okay, great, get to work. <laughs> so um, we have that going for us. And that, that part I'm not sure I can give you. Because that part comes from having a deeper goal. And the deeper goal that I hope all of you can have uh, you know, by the end of this talk or you know, somewhere in your life is that you want to decrease suffering of yourself and others. You want happiness and you also want others to have happiness. You want to benefit this world. You want to benefit others. And um, that's something that um, if you get motivated to do that and then you, can, you find a way of connecting your job with benefiting people and benefiting this world and wanting that, then um, you'll get that part. But um, if, you, if you don't do that, then uh, you'll be working for some other reason and some other motivation, and that's not as powerful. So um, I really uh, I, want, I want to plug that motivation and that intention. And one, of, one of the reasons that I'm happy to uh, teach at Google and um, do things that will help benefit you. And as, as a Lama, you should just know, my intention is not to make you better Google employees. My intention is to decrease your suffering and increase your happiness. As a Lama, that's actually my job. But I can, I can give you some tips and tools and things that will help you. And if you want, you could apply them to work here, and you, you'll be a better worker. And um, I feel uh, not so many reservations in sharing some of them, because uh, you know, I, I've heard that Google has things like, you know, don't be evil policy. And, you know, basically, I, I like many of the things that Google is doing. So, uh, you know, I, I, feel, yeah, I, I feel okay about teaching you guys some of this stuff. All right. So the first thing we want to do if um, you know, we want to talk about happiness and suffering and um, being happy at work and not suffering. And basically, you get burned out. Why? Because you have a lot of stress. Well, why do you have a lot of stress? 
because of fear. You fear that if this doesn't go well, or if this project fails, or if um, you know, my team doesn't get that bid, or you know, if, if I look bad, if I look incapable or incompetent or something, then, then oh, I'm going to get blamed, or there's going to be you know, disgrace or demotion or you know, whatever it is involved. There's, there's some fear lurking in the background. And that's, that's true for everybody. And we all have some background fears and hopes. And those things motivate us. We get up out of bed every morning because of fear and hope. We have some kind of hope for happiness. It may be very subconscious. It may be kind of nebulous. You know, I, I want, maybe you want praise. Maybe you want glory. Maybe you want wealth. Um, Whatever it is, there's something in your mind, and it's a little different for everybody, but something gets you out of bed every morning in the hope uh, arena. Then also there's some fear. Oh man, if I don't get up, I'm going to be late. And if I'm late, then there's this consequence. And then I've got to deal with that. And then this person, oh yeah, they will definitely say that. Mm -hmm. I'm out of bed, right? There's, there's something in terms of fear that gets you out of bed in the morning. Now, if you want to be a happier, better, more functional, more productive person, what's going to have to happen is hope and fear are going to have to land on the right objects. What that means is sometimes we're afraid of things, but those things don't actually produce suffering for us. And sometimes uh, they're like paper tigers. They look scary, but you know, as soon as you like really investigate, oh yeah, Happiness, happiness, or suffering didn't really come from that. You know, oh, oh, that um, now, uh, you know, now that person uh, is, is not so happy with me, or, or that, uh, that, that pretty girl or that good looking guy doesn't look at me anymore. It's like, oh, wait, I, that, that wasn't the cause of my suffering. I can still be happy now. Um, but inside, we've got a, fun, a bunch of funny ideas about you know, where, where suffering comes from. It's the same with happiness. And um, there are a lot of messages in the world today about where your happiness comes from and where your suffering comes from, and they're not consistent with Buddhist teachings. There's this idea that, um, that happiness is derived from interaction with material objects somehow. If I, if I get that car, or if I get that sweetie, or uh, you know, if, if I eat that food, or... You know, if I, if I get this great massage or whatever it is, then I will, I will get happiness from that. Happiness is contained in that thing, and that's why I need to buy it. I need to get it. I need to go after it. And um, inside of us, there's, there's a part that believes that, you know, sort of the delusional part, the part that keeps us in samsara, that buys into that. Um, but if we, if we apply logic we can see, oh yeah, there's actually no way that happiness is contained in material objects. And so I will use chocolate as an example. It's one of my favorite examples because, mmm, yeah, that's right, mmm, chocolate. Just think about, mmm, I got a little saliva, mmm, water, mouth-watering, great chocolate. Yeah, I love chocolate. So I think chocolate contains happiness because when I eat chocolate, I feel good. For example, I take a piece of chocolate. I don't have chocolate with me, sorry. I take a piece of chocolate and I eat it. I go, mmm, ah, yeah, that's good. Mmm. Well, if that's true, then by eating the second piece of chocolate, logically, I should derive twice as much happiness from that experience. So I eat a second piece of chocolate. Yeah, that one's pretty good too. Let's go for ten times the happiness. Yeah, you can see where this is going. This is ending at 100 pieces of chocolate. I, I've, I've never gotten there, actually. But it's probably ending with me going to the bathroom and being sick. So you can see, logically, if happiness were contained in chocolate, then uh, it wouldn't happen like that. I could just eat more chocolate and feel better uh, infinitely. Now, that's because even though we, we cling to chocolate as a source of happiness, and where chocolate is, you can you know, insert any material object or, uh, you know, any, uh, any praise or, uh, you know, fame or support from others. You know, if, if Axel praised me, Axel's my, my good friend, my student, and he says, um, 
yeah, if Axel praises me, I feel good. Because Axel's really great, and what, what he says is meaningful to me. You know, when we, I, I think he has some insightful things to say, and he, if he praises me, like, oh, yeah, I'll feel good. Well, then, what if he praised me twice? What if he praised me ten times? What if he, what if he just followed me all around, all day, praising me? He'd be like, bro, I'm trying to use the toilet. Can you go away? <laughs> so, as um, what Buddha taught is those things don't actually contain happiness. And, you know, those, those other things, most of the things we fear actually don't contain suffering. So, what Buddha taught is that in order to really understand happiness and suffering, you have to understand yourself a little bit. Who you are, according to Buddha's teaching, is uh, just mind, consciousness, this single present moment thinking only. That's you. This present moment knowing, choosing, feeling, deciding, this awareness, that's who you actually are. Not your brain, not your body, not your name, whatever it says on your Google badge. That, that's not actually who you are. Who you are is one aware mind. When every time you think, you have some intention, you want something, you don't want something, you engage in action, that creates energy. That energy is called karma. It's the power of thinking, the habit of thinking. Then from that karma, um, that actually produces your experience of reality. We perceive things because of our thinking and the power of our thinking, our karma. Now, in, in one hour at a podium at Google, I'm not going to have time to go into all of the logic and ins and outs for why this is true and you should believe it versus other things. But um, I'll speak a little bit to, to Buddha's credibility and uh, why we should listen to Buddha as opposed to listening to the countless other messages that we could be listening to right now. Buddha, first of all, you should know, Buddha isn't just some guy in India centuries ago. Buddha is actually a state of mind. That mind, that, that present moment, moment awareness, who you are, if you eliminate all of your obscurations and you actually see reality as it is, that is Buddha. So many beings have achieved Buddha, not just uh, Siddhartha Gautama. And when, uh, when, in, when Siddhartha did attain enlightenment, he became you know, Buddha Shakyamuni. He rested under the Bodhi tree for 49 days, and then he, he went and taught his friends. And he was starting to build a following, and eventually uh, he went back to the Shakya clan and met his family. And what Buddha said, Buddha is so cool, because um, he, he walked in and he said, the first thing he said was, I have achieved enlightenment. I know everything. I'm omniscient, essentially. Now, the next thing he said wasn't worship me which is probably where a lot of people would go after making the first statement. The second thing he said was, test me. And they tested him. Actually, I think quite scientifically and quite empirically, um, the test they derived for Buddha was they, uh, in the royal garden, they set all these urns, all, all these bowls, and in them they put ash. And in the different places, you know, they, where did that ash come from? Well, it depended on the bowl. And they went to all these different places in the kingdom. And they got you know, leaves from you know, this minister's peach tree, and some grass from over there, and a couple branches from this place. And you know, someone was you know, keeping track. And there's like a hundred of these bowls. And everything's been totally reduced to ash, so it's equally gray powder. Everything looks the same. And so they, they walked Buddha around and said, okay, where did this ash come from? Where did this ash come from? Where did this ash come from? And Buddha would not only tell them where it came from, but he would give them more details than, he would, than they were expecting him to give. Oh yeah, this came from Minister So-and-So's backyard, uh, the fourth tree in the row, east side, fourth branch up. And it was cut by Bobby or whatever his name was. And, um, and they, their jaws just dropped. Wow. So, and they believed him. Now, of course, for us, you know, almost 3,000 years later, it makes a pretty story, basically. Yeah, okay, you can, you can say that, but basically you have no evidence this actually happened. 
Well, I'll, I'll tell you then about, uh, for me personally, my urns of ash. You know, one of the reasons I, I, I consider what Buddha says to be credible. There's this sutra. It's this really cool sutra called the Sutra of the Big and Small. And in it, Buddha describes the size of different things. And I don't know, I don't fully understand why that was so important for Buddha say, to say at that time, but I am so grateful that he said it, uh, reading it today. Buddha went, says, uh, okay, this is an arm span, or uh, there's a junk job, and it's, you know, this many arm spans. And then an arm span is really four cubits, you know, one, two, three, four. Okay, and that's so many palm heights, and there's all these things are relative, right? So my, my cubit and Axel's cubit or your cubit are not the same, and then we got down to like sun dust specks and louse eggs, and you know, this many sun dust specks and a louse egg, and you know, we're, this is in uh, spring of 2010, and we're going through uh, translating some of this sutra. And we get down and down and down, and seven of this, and seven of this, and seven of this, and okay, okay, okay. And then finally we get to iron atom, or particle of iron. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. There, there's, there's, no, there's no, like, European uh, uh, iron particle versus African, you know, like, like, the, uh, like the swallows. And, um, yeah, that's right, Monty Python. Okay. <laughs> there's... Um, you know, there, there's no difference between uh, iron particles. Uh, it, it's, it's not like this louse egg versus that louse egg. So we did what sensible modern people would do. We googled the size of an iron atom. And we found three pages that we thought, okay, this is really credible. And we, uh, they, actually the result was very slightly different. But they were really, really close. And so we just averaged them and we thought, okay, According to our ability, that's the best we could possibly do in terms of discerning, de uh, determining the size of an iron atom. And so we, we just took that. It was, you know, one point da 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 times 10 to the negative 35th or something and uh, meters. And we plugged it into the sutra. Okay, times 7 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 times 4 times uh, 10 or, or whatever it is. And um, finally we got to one arm span. Now, you guys are all pretty good at math, presumably, so I don't have to tell you that if, if Buddha picked the size of an iron atom and just put it into that equation and got anywhere within 100 feet, we'd all be amazed. That would be really incredible if he did that. Well, according to the Sutra of Big and Small, if you drop an iron atom, the size of an iron atom in there, it comes out to an arm span of nine feet. That's amazing. How do you know that? 2,950 years ago. How on earth could you possibly know that? And then what's really cute is sort of like the little cherry on top, is um, if you look to the sutras, Buddha's height was actually pretty close to nine feet. So if Buddha was talking about his arm span, then it's actually, uh, he was right on. Only like three inches taller than the current uh, Guinness Book of World Records holder, by the way. Um, so Buddha, having awakened his mind, achieved enlightenment, um, has access to information that we simply do not through our obscured minds and our obscured five senses. Um, Buddha sees reality as it is. And so he can see things that are basically beyond our imagination to even see um, and know things that are beyond what we can imagine. And so when Buddha tells us, okay, actually your happiness and suffering, they, they don't come from uh, grouchy faces and chocolate bars. Um, your happiness and suffering come from your own mind. That's what Buddha taught. You are this mind. You are present moment thinking only. And in every moment, you think something. You choose. You want something. You don't want something. Well, when you think and you want something and you fear something that's in discord with how things actually are, you're going against the grain of reality, so to speak. And that, uh, that actually produces suffering. When fear lands on the wrong object, we get what we call anger. We decide, I'm suffering because of you. It's your fault. And then we take out all our aggression on that object. And um, you know, that, of, that 
produces this special energy of attacking the phenomena that our mind and our karma have created. And uh, you know, since all that we perceive is the creation of our mind, when, you, when mind attacks mind's creation, it produces suffering. Sentient beings don't recognize, yeah, what I perceive right now is the creation of my mind. We see something we don't like and we just go after it. Well, that produces this karma, this energy of anger. Then that comes back and produces more bad experiences. It produces more, um, we call it negative thinking, thinking that you know, runs against reality, the way things that actually work. Um, it produces more negative thinking. It ripens as more... Uh, negative characteristics, more obscured characteristics. We make worse value judgments. You know, we're quick to argue, all, all of those things that you know, we don't like when we imagine a, a decent person who can function in society. And when these bad experiences arise, then we're even more inclined to go after them. And of course, that just produces more of that energy, more of that energy, that karma of anger. So. That's how that uh, cycle perpetuates. The same, the same thing happens with uh, misplaced hope. We call that greed. We had some good thinking sometime in the past, but you know, from beginning this time until now, we must have done or thought some good things. Well, that created some good energy, this thing we call positive karma. That ripens as uh, good experiences, nice things, chocolate bars, um, all of that stuff that we like. Well, when this mind, present moment thinking, this, this awareness, doesn't recognize its own creation and decides, oh, happiness, I finally found it, wonk, and goes for it, that is what we call greed. And that idea of, yeah, happiness isn't here. I don't have happiness. I don't have good qualities. Happiness must be out there. I need to go get that thing. That energy of chasing happiness of squeezing happiness actually prevents us from getting nice things. And it also ruins the, the good things that we do have. Now, some people, no matter what they have, they're always looking for more. And they're never content. Some people have you know, billions of dollars in the bank, and they literally will not buy themselves a new pair of pants. Because so much they squeeze. Money is happiness. I need to get this. Money, money. I just need to get more. I can't let any of that go. That kind of thinking and the energy, the karma created by that thinking, uh, creates terrible suffering for them in the future. So what Buddha taught is suffering. And this is the first enlightened truth, the truth regarding suffering. My suffering is actually the result of my negative thinking and negative karma. So this thinking that doesn't recognize, I'm this one aware mind. What I perceive is the creation of this mind. The thinking that doesn't recognize that is negative thinking. And then it's little cronies, this ignorance. That is ignorance, the root of all negative thinking. Then it's little cronies, anger and greed and jealousy and pride and that kind of stuff uh, will arise concomitantly. They always come on board. They're tagging along. And so... We, uh, not recognizing who we are and what's going on, we engage wrongly with our phenomena, with our experiences. This is actually the root cause of suffering. And um, when we recognize this, a couple of things happen. One, we start to really dislike our anger and dislike our greed. Think, you know what? That doesn't work for me. When I'm angry, I'm not happy. That, and that's something that, you know, discerning iron atom sizes aside, we can all probably relate to. When you're raging pissed off, you're not happy. Those two things don't happen at the same time. When you are desperately greedy, you know, desperately you know, in the pangs of lust or you know, craving or whatever it is, you're not happy. You don't have like, oh yeah, I've just got a little ball of warm Buddha happiness in my heart. You, you don't think that at the same time as you're salivating and, and chasing after that thing. That kind of thinking is suffering. It is not happiness. And it produces suffering. It produces miserable experiences. So if you're having experiences that you don't like, you can look to the first noble truth, the truth regarding suffering. 
and say, okay, um, this suffering I experience is the result of my negative thinking and negative karma as cause, then other people's uh, negative thinking and negative karma, their grouchiness, of course that's a condition. It's not that we're not affected by others. It's just that the causal mechanism for what actually produces happiness and suffering, it's here. Cause, condition. Cause, condition. Just like that. So, how can we relate this to our work environment? Well, not putting fear on the wrong object. Oh my gosh, if my project fails. Oh my gosh, if I'm not smart enough to think of this. You know, oh my gosh, if uh, I get kicked off my team or, or I don't get to go on the team I want or whatever it is. Yeah, then I'll really suffer. No, not really. Not necessarily. If you don't have anger, jealousy, greed, pride, and ignorance, you won't suffer. It doesn't matter what team you're on or whether your project succeeded or failed or if uh, you know, people like you or if they start serving the thing you want to eat in the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, actually, the suffering came from your own mind, from, from those attitudes. And um, if you start placing your fear on the right object, your own bad thinking, bad attitudes, those things. And stop placing fear on the wrong objects, what happens to happen at Google today. You'll stress a lot less. You'll have less fear. You'll have less anxiety. You'll have, less of a, you'll have more of a sense of equanimity about what happens around you. Yeah, it was uh, you know, kind of a, it was chaos today at work. But I had a good attitude, and you know, I, uh, I, I like my coworkers, at least some, and I, I, want them, I want them to have happiness. I want them to be less miserable, at least. At least if, if they suffered less, I know that they would, they would be nicer to other people. So, yeah, I want them to suffer less. That's called compassion. That, that, that's, that's positive thinking. That's the cause of happiness. I want them to have more happiness. That's love. That's positive thinking. And you can just... You can just Rest in that and enjoy that and accumulate that. You can be your own little happiness machine. Every time you, every time you think uh, kind, benevolent, benevolent, altruistic thoughts towards yourself or others or you know, your coworkers or the world around you, you actually produce uh, the causes of happiness. That thought right there is the causes of happiness. Like we had the example with anger, right? It's hard to be really, really happy and relaxed and joyful while you're extremely upset. Well, now think of, think of when uh, somebody you love, they came back from you know, school or the office or whatever, and something, something really wonderful happened to them. And you so delighted in that. You were just, wow, that's so good that happened to you. That's really marvelous. I wish that happened to you every day. Because you're so cool, and when good things happen to you, I'm, uh-oh, happy about that. That kind of thinking, that love, actually is the cause of happiness. It's been arising from our own minds since beginning this time. We just haven't uh, recognized that. So, <clears throat> anyway, what we can see is um, when we have anger, greed, ignorance, those things, we're less happy, we're more stressed, and we're less productive. So, um, you know, even, even, even if, uh, you know, this, uh, you, know, you, you don't want to be a Buddhist or practice Buddhism or something, at least try to decrease your negative thinking because it'll make you a better worker. <laughs> you'll be less stressed and you'll be able to focus better and you won't be panicked all the time because you, you won't get uh, disturbed every time something happens that... Um, you know, other people aren't necessarily, necessarily okay with. There will always be some fire to put out. There will always be somebody panicked about something. But you get to decide if you want to join them in that. Now, this person has decided, I am, I'm going to freak out and suffer because of this is happening. Would you like to join? It'll be great, believe me. Um, no, just decide, no. I'm, I'm, I'll help you put out the fire, man, but I'm not going to get flustered over this. It doesn't help me, it doesn't help you, it doesn't help put out the fire, it doesn't help this world, it doesn't help Google, if, if, if that's on your uh, you know, tick list, help Google. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, this, uh, you know, this, uh, this negative thinking, 
yeah, it's the cause of your suffering. That's where your stress comes from. That's where your burnout comes from. And it's, it's the cause of your suffering. It's the condition of others' suffering, which means to the extent that they have anger and greed and those things in mind, uh, your, your bad ener- energy can join them and make them suffer more. And so uh, normally we don't like that unless we really don't like someone. But um, that, that, that thinking of not liking them and wanting them to suffer, oops, that's the cause of suffering for you too, so better, better let go of that. Then the third enlightened truth is uh, where happiness does come from, and basically. We, uh, normally we think, if, if I just get what I want, then I'll be happy, or you know, if I get praised or whatever it is. Um, I think normally when we, when we live our daily lives, we just think I need to get that or I need to do that. Um, you know, our deep core belief about where our happiness comes from, I think, is largely subconscious. We, uh, we got a pat on the head from our father when we were six, or um, you know, somebody we, we were attracted to smiled at us when we were 13. You know, whatever, whatever it is, whatever it was, we got, oh yeah, that's it. I got to get more of that. And then what gets you out of bed in the morning is to go get that. And then everything else you do is just a mechanism for that. Um, but in the, the, the candy bar example or the actual bothering me all day with praise example, we, we can see logically that those things actually don't produce happiness for us. What Buddha taught is that, um, well, on one level, happiness comes from you know, positive thinking, this quality of, I recognize who I am, I recognize what's going on. Um, and you know, so from that, I'm going to have goodwill towards myself and others. I'm going to uh, do good things, basically. Yeah, happiness comes from that, but there's, there's a deeper truth to happiness. Buddha originally taught the third noble truth as the truth of cessation. Which, which that, that's not a get word. That's a gone word. That's something left, something ceased, something ended. Buddha said, actually, decreasing your negative thinking, your anger, greed, ignorance, that actually is the cause of your happiness. You do that more, and you will naturally be more happy. And that's because, deep down inside, you actually are the happiness you were looking for. Your own nature, the nature of mind, which means you, this present moment thinking, this awareness, unobscured, you know, we remove, we clean out all that anger, all that greed, all that ignorance, all that stuff. Who you are in essence is true happiness. That's the happiness you've always been seeking. That's why you want happiness, you know, because, because your nature agrees with happiness. But failing to recognize that, you go looking for it in other places. And of course, you are never fulfilled when you seek happiness from things outside of your own mind. They never produce the happiness that you actually wanted. So because your nature is the happiness that you've been seeking, your nature actually is Buddha, um, cessation is happiness. The truth of happiness is actually the truth of cessation. The more you clean off that diamond, the more it sparkles. And you are that diamond. You are that thing that you've been looking for. Your own aware mind is the producer of your happiness if you cultivate yourself. <clears throat> then, of course, uh, when we have this happiness, ease, peace, joy, those things, um, we're better at other stuff. Um, and one of, one of the things we do at the retreat center is uh, you know, sort of, sort of one, one of the litmus test, uh, tests of how our practice is going. Because we don't just sit around on the cushion all day, right? Is how much more, how much, uh, more joyfully productive can you be? If, uh, if you actually train your mind well in Dharma, you'll be able to do more than you used to be able to do. Because you're not freaking out all the time. Yeah, I know happiness and suffering come from here, not all this other stuff. So I I don't see any of this stuff as an object that could freak me out if I'm practicing. I I got my bad days too, you know, I'm I'm a work in progress. But Buddha taught enlightened beings only fear one thing. 
That's their own negative thinking. Besides that, an enlightened being fears nothing. Imagine how not burned out you would be, how not stressed you would be if you had exactly zero fear, except for your own anger, greed, and ignorance. Great. The only thing I'm afraid of is also the only thing I have control over, my own mind. Actually, we have control over our own minds. If we practice, if we make effort. And that's where, um, you know, that, that's the fourth noble truth, the truth regarding the path. Your own love, compassion, and wisdom. Wisdom is when you recognize, yeah, I'm this mind. This mind produces energy, karma, that ripens as the experience of phenomena. Yeah, but this, this one aware mind, that's what I am, and that's, that's how this, this experience of reality works. And my nature is, is pure, is happiness, if I uh, manage to unobscure that. So that wisdom, and then uh, from that, uh, there's this other thing that arises called compassion. Yeah, I'm, I'm this one aware mind. I don't like suffering. So I will decrease and eliminate its causes. Whether they're in my mind, you know, I, I have some control, or I have real control over that. Or in your mind, I can't control your minds. Um, but I can, I can... I can be a condition. I can push your mind around a little bit. Hey, 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 try this. It really works. It's really cool. It's great. Um, I can't make you do it, but hopefully I can encourage you. If you do, do to the extent that you decrease your anger, greed, and ignorance, you will find happiness. No matter what happens at work, no matter what happens in life, to the extent that you increase your anger, greed, and ignorance. It doesn't matter what team you're on. It doesn't matter what promotion you got. It doesn't matter what car you drive. It doesn't matter how good your sweetie looks. You will suffer. That, that's the bottom line. And so the path is practicing that wisdom, love, and compassion. That's it. That's the path. Now, <clears throat> For, uh, for Buddhism, for Buddhists, this is, this is where uh, Dharma actually becomes kind of a hard sell. Because you have to do work. I, I, I will increase your workload. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you decide, I'm, you know, I'm going to follow this teacher, I'm going to listen to this guy or whatever. This will increase your workload. Because I'll give you new projects, you'll have new things to do, you'll have to you know, tame your mind and maybe watch your breath and sit up straight and um, you know, think good thoughts while you do your other stuff. But, but those things, those Dharma practices you do, actually will make everything else easier. Because you won't be afraid. You won't burn out about it. You won't freak out about it. If, if you don't think suffering is going to come from this stuff, you won't be bothered by it. Imagine if none of this stuff bothered you. Only your little anger bothered you and you have control over that. That's a good life. That's a good way to go through life. That's a good way to do things. Yeah, I could, I could get things done. Think of how much energy we spend you know, trying to get the perfect conditions so we could focus. But what if we just decided the conditions weren't that important? I'm going to focus anyway. If you cultivate the power of your mind, you'll be able to do that. If you cultivate wisdom, love, and compassion, you will tame your mind. You will be in control of your mind. And that is actually freedom. True freedom isn't just doing what you want all the time. Doing what you want all the time, especially if you have greed and anger and those things, that's actually just being a slave to your uh, lust and uh, anger and those, thi and those things. If you do it all, what you want all the time, then uh, uh, I think we know as grown-ups that's going to create problems for us. But if you, if you change what you want, if you look to the actual causes of happiness and suffering and make your wants in accord with them, if you, if you tame your mind with love and wisdom and compassion, You'll find happiness is all the time uh, sustainable, peaceful, doesn't require chocolate bars, the whole thing. So um, Dharma is a hard sell sometimes because you've got to actually work in order to get something. But those who um, I think are successful in life, those who have achieved something, uh, you know 
there's no achievement without effort. And um, those achievements that, you know, you got as sort of freebies, they, they mean less. There's, a more feeling, there's more of a feeling of hollowness there. Um, you will get according to the effort you make. You, know, you want to get something, you've got you to gotta make effort. You've got to give something. And that's where you, know, you, you can look as people who you know, maybe don't know a lot about Dharma, but you can say, yeah, I, I hate hearing that message, but it's true. And so you know that you know, there's, there's a certain authenticity to Buddha's teaching here. If you want happiness, you're going to have to work for it. But if you work smart, if you, if you actually seek happiness in the right places, you'll actually get it. And if you do that, um, you won't be stressed. You won't burn out. Another, so that's, that's the teaching I really wanted to give you as a Lama, because really what I want is for you to not suffer and have happiness. But I've got, I've got one, one more kind of, um, it, it all kind of related to work, but I've got, I've got one more sort of, sort of freebie that is uh, maybe easier to apply to work. It's silencing your own mental complaining. And that, that takes a little discipline to do, but you'll really like it if you manage to pull it off. You look at your situation. You know, I'm on this team. I've got this assignment. I get up at this time. I you know, do this. This is my life. This is my situation. And you decide, am I down for this? Do I agree with this? Is this, is this what I want to be doing? And if not, then find a way to change it and make changing it what you want to be doing. But if you decide, yeah, overall, this is good. I, I can't think of the other place I would rather be than this, which would be great. I mean, I think a lot of the world actually kind of looks to you as the people who got it and like have what they want and are in the place where like this is the dream job. You know, what, what, whatever your job is, I don't know. As soon as you pull that badge and you walk past that security door and you're in, you have everyone on Earth's dream job except the people who want to sell hot dogs. You don't have their dream job. But everybody else, you have their dream job. Um, so if you decide, OK, I agree with this. I signed up for this. At that point, all of your mental complaining, oh, this is tired. Oh, this person is, is being mean to me. Or, oh, this, you know, I don't like this deadline. Or, you know, I don't like this workload. Well, you signed up for that. And if you're deciding to stay here, then there, there's, there's one very special message you can give all of that sort of internal whining. Yeah, shut up. Really. Because that, that internal complaining sabotages all of your efforts. Actually, listening to that voice is more tiring than the work you're doing. I guarantee it. Because I translate, I run the property, I, um, I'm the internship director for an international internship for the next three years. I'm an integral part of the, tr uh, the translation program. I have a lot of jobs. And I can tell you, the thing that taxes me the most, that actually requires more energy from me than anything else, is my own internal complaining. And when I silence that voice, I have energy. Because I'm engaged in the stuff I want to be doing. And when I, when I let that voice run rampant, I just feel exhausted. So, so that's, uh, that's the piece I would, I would, I would offer you. Is, you, know, if you. If you really want to not burn out, if you really want to manage your stresses, deal with that. Um, and of course, that requires some cultivation too. Uh, but uh, you know, there's, there's, there's plenty of tools and techniques for that. You know, this is... Uh, this is, this is not like the workshop teaching where you know, I walk you through everything and we count our breaths together and all that stuff. There's a lot of other teachings like that. And um, you know, if, if you're interested and um, you know, think, wow, there's, there's really good stuff here, you can check out our website. It's thebuddhapath.org. Thebuddhapath.org. The Buddha Path, the the Buddha Path is our lineage, Dzogchen lineage. And um, yeah, we, we don't really have a center in Seattle, but there's retreats going on. We have an events page. There's teachers. I'm on it. You'll, you'll find me if you go through enough hamburger menus. I'll be there. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, if you just decide to do those things, you make a decision, uh, you'll find the mechanism. I have a question that um, 
is sort of adjacent to that because this talk was was very focused on happiness derived from the mind. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how much your teachings or Buddhist teachings uh, play into, I guess, some mind-body connections. Because, mm -hmm. for example, if I miss a night's sleep, I feel really crappy. Yeah. And I that is a form of suffering. And yeah. my mind feels worse. So yeah. it feels like... Uh, if I slept more, that would be a way of erasing suffering yeah. from my experience. Um, but another way that I can interpret your teaching is that my own suffering is just my dissatisfaction with having missed the sleep. So, so which, mm. how, how would you, uh, that's a great question, sort of apply yeah. that. That's a great question. And yeah, they're, they're both, um, the, the feeling in your body, having not slept enough, that is a condition of suffering. The dissatisfaction and you know, sort of mental whining, that is the cause of suffering. But that condition is real, for sure. Now, if you, if you just missed a night's sleep or you got you know, four hours or whatever it is, yeah, I'm not going to pretend you can just think happy thoughts and it will all go away. Um, but when you, when you practice negative thinking, that actually produces harmful chemicals in your body. It drains your mind. It poisons your body. It does all that stuff. And it, there, there's, a, there's a litany of mind-body connection videos that talk about that kind of stuff. You know, that when, you, when you have love and compassion and that stuff, it actually produces medicinal chemicals in your body. If you, if you really train your mind deeply, especially if you wake up, you become enlightened, it won't matter if you miss a night's sleep. But... Um, I know, we're, I'm, I'm working on that, right? <laughs> but um, in the meantime, there's a couple things you can do. First, don't let, don't let your mind go crazy over having missed some sleep. And the second thing is, um, and this is one, it's great, I was thinking about talking about this a little bit, is um, making more strategic effort. And part of that is drawing boundaries. You're always going to have people around you that say, this has to be done immediately. This is your top priority. Okay, great. Yeah, put it on my desk with all my other top priorities. That's right. I, I know how that is. Um, but at a certain point, you have to get strategic and make a boundary and say, you know what? The best thing I can do to accomplish all this stuff on time is get a decent night's sleep. Even, even, if, even if this guy doesn't get what he wants right away on time, I know that overall... You know, for myself, for my coworkers, for Google, for the world, for you know, whatever you're working for, my I'm going to be less of a benefit if I don't get a neat, decent night's sleep. And then you've just got to take it. And um, you know, if uh, if that's not okay with your higher ups or whatever it is, then you know, let let the chips fall where they may. But um, you know, you 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 can't do the work I think that Google or any sensible employer wants you to do if you're you know, burning the candle at both ends and, you know, your sleep is tanking. So you gotta, you gotta make space for yourself. How do you, uh, define or think about happiness? Is it the absence of suffering? Is mm -hmm. it some other state or yeah. quality that uh, yes. is meant to be pursued? Yeah. Uh, we've, we've got two kinds of happiness we can talk about. We've got relative happiness and absolute happiness. Absolute happiness would be your nature, your innermost essence, you, Minus all of your obscurations, that is true happiness. It is absolute happiness. It's the unchanging happiness that you've been seeking. Relatively, your happiness is uh, your compassion, your love, your wisdom. When you hold those thoughts in mind, that actually is happiness. And then, of course, decrease it. Well, those thoughts, that compassion, love, and wisdom, they naturally decrease the, the, the contradicting thoughts, the ignorance, anger, and greed. It also decreases that negative karma, the, the energy of that. Um, so yeah, relatively your positive thinking is your happiness. And then um, your positive thinking will produce uh, positive karma, which ripens as um, nice things, nice phenomena. And those are conditions of happiness. They'll support your happiness to continue to arise. They'll support your positive thinking to continue to arise. Um, but you know, just like the chocolate example, uh, they're not actually happiness. They just are good at supporting happiness. Like a you know, totally tired, exhausted, I haven't slept in three nights body is, is a condition of, um, of suffering. I, I hope that all of you got something uh, very meaningful from this talk. And I hope that you all derive benefit from it. 
and especially I hope, I hope that you've, uh, you've become inspired at least a little bit to investigate, yeah, what actually is the cause of happiness? What is the cause of suffering? And how do I increase the former and decrease the latter? And uh, I, I wish you 100% the best on your path. I wish you 100% uh, true happiness and every uh, little temporary beneficial worldly success along the way. Thank you.